happiest day was when we went on the Big Dipper. It was scary. Scary because it was a hundred years old. Dad felt alive. Escaped his body. When he died, he said he wanted his ashes sprinkled off the Big Dipper. Hello there. Have you fallen into an open manhole recently? Do you find yourself in the company of strangers? Well, then you might very well be in the feature underground. As a doctor once told me, my name is Hunter Lanier. I come once more bearing gifts in the form of movie reviews. This time it is Memoirs of a Snail to be released in theaters by IFC Films on November 8th. Before I start talking about the movie, I do want to quell any trepidations that may exist with this being an animated movie. It's understandable to have the preconceived notion that no matter how well reviewed an animated film is, it is going to put the interests of children before the interests of adults. This is not the case for Memoirs of a Snail. Nothing in the movie is dumbed down, nothing is smoothed out, nothing is homogenized. They will not be playing this movie on Cartoon Network, if that even still exists. And in case you don't believe me, I will say that Memoirs of a Snail is one of the very best movies I have seen all year. I just wanted to get that out there because I know that predisposition exists. Another quick thing I want to get out of the way is that if you enjoy listening to this review, do me a solid, give it a like, give it a comment, subscribe if you haven't subscribed. What I would like to do in my small way is to bring a little decorum and cultivation to the internet. And something as small and effortless as a like can do big things for getting the video seen. But enough about me, let's talk about you. And by you, I mean Memoirs of a Snail. Memoirs of a Snail is the first directorial effort by Adam Elliott in over 15 years. His last movie was the critically acclaimed Mary and Max. And Memoirs of a Snail is very much in that same aesthetic. It's a stop motion animated film, but it has a grungier visual style to match its more adult themes. There's a yellowish tint to the whole movie, as if the film reel was used as a urinal cake. Whereas in another stop motion movie, you might find adorable little figures of coffee mugs and violins and cute little bunny rabbits. In Memoirs of a Snail, you find figurines of greyhound buses, topless old ladies, and snail semen. The style sort of reminds me of a stop motion 3D rat fink Ed Roth sort of style. But for as much as Adam Elliott likes to play in the stylistic dirt, the movie is actually incredibly heartfelt, and effectively so, which is a whole nother thing. It's sincere without ever being sentimental. It's morbid without ever embracing depression. You know, there's an oft-quoted line by, from a book by the writer uh, J.K. Chesterton, where he says, angels can fly because they take themselves lightly. As tragic, dark, and grotesque as Memoirs of a Snail can be, it always takes itself lightly and to its great benefit. So, how dark, tragic, and grotesque is Memoirs of a Snail? Well, it's a movie about life, so the answer is very. But, like life, it is a lot of other things too. The life of the main character, Grace, is not a charmed one, but it's not an unusual one either. She's born as part of a set, her twin brother Gilbert following soon after, and she is also born with a deformed mouth that gets her labeled rabbit face by the time she sets foot on a schoolyard. When she's taken to the doctor to get her mouth fixed, her brother accepts the doctor's need for a blood donor, and that's before he realizes that donating blood won't kill him. Now, that is a little small example of how deftly the movie can tug at your heartstrings without using a full orchestra. Their father is a former street performer turned present alcoholic, all because he was hit by a drunk driver and lost his physical ability to perform. Though he succumbs to his own despair in life, he only exemplifies joy and curiosity for his children. Gilbert, having inherited the performing bug from his father, spends a lot of his free time literally playing with fire. He's a great example of what a pyromaniac 
can be if he gets enough hugs. Grace, on the other hand, a pariah at school, recedes into the loving yet slimy embrace of her snail pets. Obviously, as you can probably tell, theirs is a broken, imperfect family, but a happy one. Now, as much as I'd love to tell you where Grace's life takes her, if you're just going to watch me describe the plot, you might as well just watch the movie. But one thing I will tell you is that she eventually meets an old woman named Pinky, voiced by Jackie Weaver. And Pinky ends up being the hero of the movie. She smokes cigars. She slept with John Denver in an airplane. No, not that one. She played ping pong with Fidel Castro. She lost her Pinky in a barroom dancing accident. Just to name a few of her almost said accomplishments. Just to name a few of her, let's say adventures. Adventures is more appropriate. Oh, and she has a few ill-fated ex-husbands, one of whom is voiced by someone I'm a big fan of, Nick Cave, so I felt I should sneak that in there. This is an Australian production, after all. And Nick Cave gets to read some poetry, so if you're a Nick Cave fan, watch the movie. Now, Pinky is the polar opposite of Grace, who, by both her nature and from growing up as a bully child, has fully receded into herself and has built this shell of her own making where she no longer experiences the low lows of life anymore, but she also doesn't experience the high highs, right? It's the double-edged sword of a life of safety and comfort. This gives you a little bit of a hint into the arc of Grace's life, which I love to be partly because of how modern it is and how, in some ways, heterodox it is. Grace should come off as a very familiar type of person we see now in this age of comfort most of us live in, where it's easier than ever to hide from reality. And Memoirs of a Snail says that that is not the answer. The answer to struggle in life isn't to hide from the struggle, it's to adapt to the struggle. Accepting the struggle as part of the palette of life. Learning to love the bomb. Other stories in recent years or in the near future that might tackle this type of person, someone who grows up a wallflower, becomes a reclusive adult, who has deeper relationships with her pets than human beings. Other stories I don't think will tell the same story as Memoirs of a Snail. I'll just leave it at that. Another great thing about the story and Grace's arc is that it's not really an arc. It's a volatile wave of bad decisions, strokes of luck, thunderbolts from God, and beautiful epiphanies. It reminded me of an Orson Welles line that I love, which is that there is, in storytelling, there is no such thing as a happy ending or a tragic ending. There is only where you choose to end the story. Speaking of the story, most of it is told through narration by Grace, who is voiced by Sarah Snook from Succession, who is apparently Australian. I had no idea. The name should have tipped me off. Snook. Sounds like something they wear on their heads. Um, I apologize to Australia. Send me a Snook. I'll wear it. Since it's told in narration, it almost comes across like a short story with pictures. And the writing is good enough to work just as a short story too. Even though you'd miss out on, on all the amazing animation, you could pull this screenplay from your bookshelf and read it like you would any other story, and you'd get a, a large portion of the same effect as the movie. In fact, the writing and the overall tone has a Dickensian quality to it, because you have disadvantaged children that grow up to be redeemed in some kind of way. You have villainous authoritarian adults. You have a large cast of quirky caricatures. You have a wry and dark sense of humor. And you have an overall hopeful worldview. And this is another thing I loved because, you know, we live in a time when Dickens is viewed as being this sort of stuffy Victorian oatmeal literature. Thank you, public school system, by the way, for instilling a love of reading in all of our citizens. That's sarcasm. But anyway, it's it's... It's nice to see this Dickensian influence pop up when you don't expect it to. So lastly, I want to stress just how funny the movie is. 
as I said before, it's very dry, it's very macabre, it's very playful, and it does a great job of blending the comedy in with the pathos. So many moments of the movie, whether it's visuals or just lines of dialogue, are both somber and funny, showing you just how powerful perspective is. As an example, there's a, there's a montage where Pinky is telling Grace about how, about what getting old is like. And she talks about, you know, bending down to, to smooth out her pantyhose and realizing she's not wearing any. That's just her skin. When we first meet Pinky, she's returning books to the library by putting them in the trash bin right next to the return slot. This may sound like hyperbole, but I don't think there's a single frame of this movie that isn't jam-packed with personality. At the beginning of this review, I mentioned that Memoirs of a Snail is a movie about life. And I know what you're thinking. That's a pretty large subject for a 90 minute movie. But what makes the movie so successful in this regard, and, every, all, and all of the praise that I've bestowed upon it up to this point comes down to this, is that it's just honest. Tragedy, comedy, romance, they're all given their due, and the presence of each bolsters the others. If this had just been a comedy about some local loser, to quote Bob Dylan, who meets a quirky old lady and they go running about town together, you wouldn't have cared about them as much. If it was just about a misfit who finally finds someone who pays attention to her and cares about her, it would have been sappy. If it had just been a tragedy about the compounding misfortune that starts from a broken family, it would have been superficially bleak. We still have a lot of movies to go, but Memoirs of a Snail is without a doubt one of the best movies I have seen in 2024. And will, I don't know exact placements or what's gonna happen, but there's no doubt in my mind it'll find a spot in my year-end best movies list. Alrighty, well, I'm all out of opinions. Leave a comment, let me know your thoughts on my thoughts. Are you interested in Memoirs of a Snail? Did you ever see Mary and Max? Once you see Memoirs of a Snail, it comes out again in theaters on November 8th. Come back to the video, let me know what you thought. Until then, I have several reviews coming up. I'm seeing Anora here, the Robert Zemeckis, Tom Hanks, Robin Wright movie on Tuesday. And then Heretic is screening on Wednesday. That's three days in a row. I don't know if I'll see all three. I'll definitely have reviews of two of those three out next week. Until then, I'll just leave you with the irrefutable truth that every day underground is a good day.